Well, welcome to this afternoon's Zoom Masterclass with Lizette the Silver Bull. We just, um, we've just opened up the Zoom room and we're waiting for all our attendees to join us. So give us a minute or so. Um, I can see the list rapidly growing. I know our panelists who will be performing are here as well. The Masterclass will take the following format. Um, Lizette's going to give a general introduction to, to um, Telemann and some questions we've been asked in advance. And then we'll be hearing three performers. We'll be hearing Marie, uh, Clara and Kira. Um, each will have around 25 minutes to work on their particular Fantasia. And we are recording the session um, so we can refer back to questions. And um, please do ask the questions in the chat function. Um, we, I, I'm here, not teaching, but ready to try and answer your questions and, and field them for Lisette. And I'll just flag up now, um, we have another session on the 21st of November, at the same time, three o'clock. This time, concentrating on Handel, so Handel's flute and recorder sonatas. So any of you who are attending this one um, and might want to participate by playing in the next one, please do let us know. You can email info at brookstreetband.co.uk. So I'll just give it an, another minute or so and then I'll make a formal introduction and start the masterclass. Thank you. Hi, Marie. Hello. Hello, nice to meet you. Welcome. Nice to meet you too. <laughs> Thank you. I had a little problem with the registration, so sorry, I am a little late. When you're here, and we're thrilled you're here. Thank you for joining us. It'll be a party of Fantasias. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I can see Clara is here as well, so that's fantastic. Uh, fantastic. Well, 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 well. Thank you for All joining. These fabulous women. Brilliant. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it should be. I was saying to um, Kira that I'm going to start off by doing a, an introduction to um, the Fantasia. There's a little bit of background information about the word itself, about um, when the Fantasias were um, written, where Telemann was, and who they may have, been, may have been written for, and some background, other stuff that hopefully will be really useful for you and interesting for whoever is listening few curious facts do which is good because <laughs> we are um in a way we are historical detectives when we play this don't we we have these beautiful instruments that um allow us to to have the closest thing there is really to the original sound because our beautiful instruments have remained so and i think that's really exciting bringing history back to life i think it's wonderful i wonder if Telemann thought ever that 350 years down the line we would be here <laughs> it was <laughs> afternoon in the middle of the lockdown, fascinating <laughs> thought, isn't it? Well, pandemic, it's talking amazing. about him, isn't that amazing? I love it. I love it. There's got to be something good. Yes, Lizette. I think we've we've probably got enough core attendees to start. So without further ado, I'm going to formally open this masterclass. We're delighted to have Marie, Clara, and Kira here to play for us today. Thanks to the wonders of modern technology. Many of you know Lizette, of course. She doesn't really need much introduction from me. She's more than capable of introducing herself, but it just gives me huge pleasure to thank you, Lizette, for doing this. You're a fantastic flautist and recorder player. We're very honored that you're part of the Brook Street Band, and I can't wait to hear the session today. So without further ado, over to you, Lizette. Well, thank you very much. I'm very humbled and honored to have such a wonderful audience and to be part of this. And thank you for, um, wanting to join us and um, and me and hearing me talk about <laughs> Telemann and all things all things Baroque. I am thrilled that we can be doing this, that there is something good in the middle of this pandemic that came out of it, that we can all meet from um, all over the world. And I cannot tell you how thrilled I am. I'm very grateful indeed that you're here. So this um, afternoon session is all about um, Telemann Fantasias. We've got three wonderful players. Um, that are going to play first uh, Fantasia number one in F major, original key D major. The second will be um, Flute Fantasia number five in C major, and the third one, Flute Fantasia number three in D minor, original key in B minor. Now, these sets, um, this Fantasias belong to a set of 12 Fantasias uh, that were printed and published around um 1727 28 
Um, and somebody before the session um, sent a question about what does fantasy mean? And I thought it would be really good to give a general description of what the word means. Um, because I know through my studies and through my career, this is something that's come up various times and I think different people will have different ideas and I think that's a wonderful thing um, and I thought I would read you from um, no other than the Oxford English Dictionary because the word is in it um, which is marvellous okay so it appears in la late Greek especially a spectral apparition <laughs> a phantom or in Latin fantasia it's also the mental process or faculty of sensuous perception. Isn't that marvellous? I, I think it's lovely. Uh, my husband, who's a linguist, told me that it also means uh, bringing something into light, awakening something, which is, I think, the most wonderful, beautiful description. The faculty of imagination. How about that? These senses pass through old French into English together with others as delusive fancy, false or unfounded notion, caprice. Now, when you talk about caprice and capricious, you, you think about quant, for instance, if you're a flute player. So this idea that fantasy, caprice, capricious, I kind of linked an idea somehow. I think it's a wonderful thing to think about. Um, using your imagination, your, your fantasy, you know, your creativity. Um, now then, um, so these senses part of French. Okay, so uh, in the time of Shakespeare, it had become more or less differentiated in sense. After the revival of Greek learning, the longer form was often felt uh, spelled fantasy with a Y, with a PH. And if you are a lover of viola da gamba music, you will know this for sure from English Golden Age music. Um, in modern use, fantasy or fantasy, in spite of the identity in sound and ultimate etymology, tend to be apprehended as separate words. The predominant sense of the former being caprice, whim, fanciful invention, imagination, and visionary notion. So I, I thought it was really lovely to start off with all these wonderful concepts because to me, that means that fantasy or fantasia, it's also a concept, it's an idea, isn't it? And if you think of pieces such as, well, composers such as Bach, fantasia, chromatica and fugue, for instance. So this is um, a word that was well within the vocabulary of Northern Germany in the 18th century. Um, now, um, Telemann was in Hamburg when he um, wrote these pieces, it is likely that he printed them himself. And I've got a fun fact and a curiosity that I thought you might find funny. <laughs> well, I certainly did. Now, it is not unusual to know that music masters and organists went from job to job. And sometimes they were uh, under contracts that were very difficult to get out of. And there's many, many um, um, examples of that, including Bach, really. But this Telemann's excuse to go to Hamburg is second to none in my book. Um, and so this is from the New Grove Dictionary of Music. And it says, on the 10th of July, 1721, Telemann was invited by the city of Hamburg to succeed Joachim Gerstenbüttel as cantor of the Johannium and as musical director of the five main churches in the city. So this is a big job big job big important job and i'm not surprised at all you wanted to go for it so the way he got out of um where he was before in frankfurt was in his letter to the frankfurt authorities asking to be released from his contract Telemann explained that he had not applied for the post and therefore regarded the offer as an act of god that's that's wonderful is it <laughs> I like that. I think as that talk about that creation and invention. God told me to, to take this. <laughs> I think it's brilliant. Now, it is not known um, who this was written originally for, by the way. And this wasn't doesn't seem to have been written for any 
uh, particular Mecenas for any particular purpose other than Telemann wanting to write it. Um, we know that there were the Burmester brothers, Rudolf and Hieronymus of Hamburg, who were great lovers of this music, and it's possible that he had um, written these with, with them in mind, really. Now, what's the context and the importance of these pieces? Now, in the 18th century, there was um, a belief that solo instruments could not carry a melody by themselves for the reason that they had no harmony sustaining them. Okay? So um, another thing that's interesting and important to know is that even in a cadenza or um, in sort of ornamentation that the thought was um, that you shouldn't do anything longer than it takes a breath to do on your own. Okay, and that's in a context of a wider piece. Now, of course, by the time he writes this, I think he is sending quite an, an important mes message that actually the flute, the recorder, the violin, he wrote. Uh, Telemann um, wrote Fantasias for the violin that were printed later in 1735, I believe, that he writes this set of 12 knowing and believing they stand by themselves. And then when you start thinking of the Bach violin partitas and sonatas and the cello suites and other repertoire for solo instruments, then it starts being put in context. Now, I think these pieces are nothing if not a wonder of imagination. They have nothing but harmonic context. And the moment you start playing them, you realize um, that you hear counterpoint in the solo writing. And this is something I hope to be able to help you with. Um, we don't have a lot of time. It's wonderful that we can be here. And all I hope is that I give you information and ideas that you can take with you and that you can carry on and um, research further. I'm always available if you want to ask me questions about books to read or further information. Um, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm really, really happy to do that. Um, I think these are character pieces. Now, Telemann was a magpie. I know I'm getting on a bit, but I think this might be really important for you before you play, because if I give you ideas, <laughs> I'm hoping that will serve as a little bit of inspiration for your gorgeous playing. But um, he was known to travel widely and also to get inspiration. He was wonderful in, in doing that. And these sets of 12 pieces really show that most certainly they do that and they are so wide in character um and structure and and the three and i'm delighted of the three fantasies we are hearing today because i will talk a little bit about um where some of the influences um come from in the 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 most sort of straightforward one perhaps is number one america which is alla francese i'm sorry oh, oh, what did you say number one that the number seven fantasy yeah. that you're playing, which is alla francese, curiously, yeah. yeah, exactly. So in the style, in the French style, so that already gives you where you may come from. Yeah. Um, but also, I think it's interesting that it's not re, re, um, written in French, it's written in Italian. <laughs> it's interesting, I love it. What a wonderful melting pot. And it's a bit like all of us here from all over the world. I love that. And I think there's a special place for that, especially now in the world that we can come together. Now, I will also, now the last thing I'm going to say uh, before we, we hear you, Marie, is talk a little bit about um, key meaning. Because nothing in the 18th century, nothing in especially um, Northern European um, music making, we can go into music of the spheres, we can go into um, the sort of number patterns and all kinds of things that are a little bit, can feel a bit nebulous, but trust me, they were very much in the thought of these composers. Um, we can, one could talk about um, temperament, for instance, of all the keys and what, it, you know, it's meant to sound like, but most certainly today we can talk a little bit or think about key meanings because nothing happened by mistake. So a composer didn't just choose 
um, a key through piece out of nowhere. He did it for a very specific reason. And again, I've chosen a few um, meanings from the time over a period of time um, that I thought you might want to know about. So for the F major sonata, which is in D major originally, Matheson, which was a very important theoreticist in 1713 says, that's D major, in this case, then transposed in F major, is somewhat shrill and stubborn. It is best suited, <laughs> how about that, to noisy, joyful, warlike, and rousing things. But at the same time, nobody will deny that when a flute, or a flute in this case, is used instead of a trumpet and a violin instead of kettle drums, even this hard key can give a special disposition to delicate things. Now, after that, there, he doesn't say anything more, but Rameau in 1722 says that F major, D major is all about songs of mirth, rejoicing, grandeur, and magnificence. Now, he was a Frenchman. This was written in very much the French style, so I think, without further ado, <laughs> I quite like to hear some gorgeous playing, please. Thank you. <laughs> We're all friends, there's no nerves. We're all good. Just take a yeah. nice deep breath. Think of beautiful things and grand things. <laughs> I hope you can hear me well. I can hear you, don't you worry. Actually, if everyone who's not playing, um, Clara and myself, if we mute ourselves, it will en enable Lisette and Marie to have a, a clearer line of communication. So we'll do that. Okay. We'll to mute. Thank you. Thank you, Marie.
you, Marie. That was wonderful. Thank you very much. I must say how much I admire all of you to be here playing live because I must stress what an amazing job these three fabulous players are doing today and what an act of courage it is to do that. And I know it's scary and I am so proud of you <laughs> to have just played that. And I know very well what it feels like. <laughs> well done. So you've got um, a really lovely, you've, there's lots of very lovely things about your playing. You've got really good grasp of a lot of technical things. I saw some really brilliant um, alternative fingerings and a really se a real sense of how the piece should go. Now, Marie, do you know what a French overture is? Mm, not really. <laughs> oh, okay, no, I can help you. Brilliant. Well, good. I can help you with that. <laughs> okay. Now, a French overture um, style was something was actually quite popular in Germany in the 18th century. It comes from France, and I'll speak a little bit about it. Um, but if you think of orchestral suites, for instance, Bach for orchestral suites, they are all starting with a French overture. Mm. Also, Telemann wrote many French overtures orchestrally. Okay, he really was a master of invention in this, which is brilliant. Okay, if you can think of France, can you think in your mind's eye the Palace of Versailles? Yeah, I was there. <laughs> oh, fantastic. So you know exactly what I mean with all the splendor and grandeur. Now, Louis XIV, in, in particular, he kind of really started this idea of um, this French style as a way of showing France to, to differentiate itself politically um, and culturally from other countries. So French style is very much, and all this etiquette, and the dancing for sure, is very much on the back of all of this. And normally when one starts um, delving into French Baroque, one of the things we talk about is um, overdotting. Okay, and that means, for instance, because I heard that a little bit already there, which was really good, Marie, <laughs> really good. Um, for instance, on this opening and an overture is something grand. Okay, and it was really funny. Um, because Rameau said of it, although he didn't know Telman would write, um, you know, this overture in this stuff for the um, solo instrument, but rejoicing, grandeur and magnificence, all of which really I can hear there. I can hear here. So a French overture is in essence a slow movement, a slowish movement, uh, typically with all this sort of dotted rhythm, the runs, the tirade, okay, da, 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 da. this sort of opening, imagine this just sweeping um, gesture, opening a grand door or a um, brush stroke of a marvelous color, <laughs> for instance, okay. Then a fugue, a, a middle section, a fast, generally quick, and a fugue going back to um, the slow and majestic movement. That really is, in very simple terms, characterizes a French overture, okay? Now, what I'd like you to do, and this goes for everyone playing solo pieces, when you're playing your instrument, never think, oh, I'm playing a recorder, oh, I'm playing a flute. What you're doing today is playing all colors of the orchestra. You're being all instruments, all singers. I want you to think outside of your instrument, okay? and see what happens. Now, as woodwind players, we're very lucky because we have to use our breath and all our breathing apparatus is very similar. Well, it is the same because we have the same bodies as singers, really. <laughs> but this idea of where we support our sound as well. I don't want to talk too much because I want you to try a few things, okay? But um, I'd like you to think of slow air. I'd like you to think of harmonic rhythm because that really determines how the piece moves as well and harmonic rhythm is the rhythm at we at which the harmony changes and shifts mm -hmm. do you see what i mean so yeah. it is really important not to create too many breaks when there are no rests 
and even rests are used for a purpose do you see what i mean yeah the first thing yeah they're, they're important aren't they they're very in fact i think it was at beethoven that said that um silence is the most important um you know in music and really it is very important um rests are never um anything but active in some way okay mm -hmm. and that's really important now the first thing I'd like you to do and is to imagine you've got a pedal note, don't you, for three bars, which is an F. So the yeah. harmony sh stays, okay? And I want you now to imagine Louis XIV in all his finery, okay, or even Jean-Baptiste to leave with his, you know, <laughs> conducting stick with all their bling, <laughs> all their fabulous clothes in his marvelous theater in Versailles. And I'd like that first note, okay, no pressure, that first note to encompass all of life and color, okay? And what we do for that low F, we've got such lovely instrument, I would just technically drop your jaw a little bit, give it lots of slow air, because if you attack a low note with a lot of punch, it will crack, as you know, <laughs> I'm sure you know. So it's getting that first sound from which everything springs. See where your resonance lie. of its storytelling. What is the image? What is the story? <laughs> so I've given you lots to think about. So in think of also the idea of Fantasia of creating, okay, of something wonderful, of bringing into light something wonderful, okay? So just have a go, just see what happens. Let's see what happens. <sighs> The main was like in in the um, in the first in the overture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the Fs, the yeah. F in, in uh, it's always the um, uh, notes that you can like jump from high the low notes. Mm -hmm. If okay, you know what great. I mean. Yeah, that's it. And so what we need to do is to find where they are, and I can hear you know what they are. Okay, so now we just need to work on bringing them out in the right way, using articulation, using dynamics, using your phrasing. So you've got in the first instance, also, I want you to have, now this is a little bit like timing is everything, by the way. And sometimes the best way to make something sound free is to be absolutely grounded and knowing in the knowledge, in the knowing of where your center is and where your pulse is, okay? I often say to my students, and those are my students who are listening in, they will probably be laughing by now because I, they know I'm going to talk about jazz <laughs> and about playing on the back of the beat, the front of the beat, and some instances, even the side of the beat. <laughs> 
so that there is elasticity, okay? Because that really greatly helps your harmonic rhythm driving it. And that is a really lovely thing. So from that note, if you've got your absolutely knowing of your center, of what the pulse is, because although this, this is in 4-4, four, four, it's not in 2-2, two, two, but personally, I really do feel um, it's very often in 2-2. In two, two. So you've got... We can really simplify this too. So phrasing wise, where are you going? <laughs> where does the first phrase go? Um, I don't know the word in English. Like, okay, it's, um, it's in your language. Yeah, it uh, goes up absolutely, and it goes towards the third bar, doesn't it? To the C. Now harmonically, so far you've kept in the tonic haven't you, in F major. Now, what happens, do you know, on the fourth bar, what chord does it go to? Because that has a significance. What chord? What do you mean? Okay, I'll tell you what it is. So don't worry, because I know sometimes with languages, it's difficult. And I know, because my first language isn't English. So <laughs> you've, got, you've got all my sympathy. <laughs> um, so the first three bars really are in F major and the tonic, which is the first degree of the scale. On the fourth bar, you move to the fifth, which is the dominant. Now the dominant chord, again, for jazz players, hello. <laughs> it's a really important chord. And it's a, a chord where um, it's a question mark, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was getting to. So from that question mark, anything can happen. Yeah. What must happen? Wow, well, that's new. Even grander. Do you see what I mean? So it's yeah. like, ta -da. if you think of opening grand doors or, you know, this wonderful gesture, that's it. And then after that, is the sort of the fun fundamental harmony and melody. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So as far as I can see, it is, it, you've got two main sort of grander gestures there. One that goes up until bar six, yeah, which is the uh, to the half bar. And then something else. And so on and so forth. Okay, so I want you to think of linking, of, of thinking of the, the bigger picture. A lot of Baroque music is about the little gestures in a wider stroke. Okay, and if you can create that with your beautiful instrument, then we are on to a really really good start. Do you want to have another go? I think we're nearly out of time, but I just wanted to leave you with that. Um, we, yeah. Lizzo, we've got, we've got, I think we, we've got till quarter two. So we've got another seven or eight minutes. Oh, and fantastic. Got... Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Cause then I can talk about the other two minutes. Fantastic. Thank you, Tati. Right, Marie, if you want to just have a go and also take your time before you start. Um, I often say that music is already there. We are, we just pick it up. We just pick it up. We just pick it up. Take your time to get into it, into your sound, opening everything, relaxing everything, finding your resonance. <sighs>
every time you play it, there are there's new things coming up. I am so proud of you. <laughs> That is really good. And what I want you to take from here is experiment. Try different things. Do you see what I mean? Really get into the music. Where does it go? Uh, what can you do with articulation? What can you do with dynamics? How can you make a phrase grow? And I'm thinking, well, first thing straight away, make sure that when you arrive after your run, after your tirat, uh, the arrival note needs to be articulated. However you do it, and another thing I really thought it was good, you're starting to use the rests. <laughs> well, good girl. Now, how long can you hold it? What is the, do you know what I mean? See, yeah. what can you do? Because you actually, I very often say that within um, within the playing, that you've got to create that magic around you, that the air around you holds your story, holds your sound. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's such an important thing, especially with these. It's a really fantastic thing. Um, yes, and then um, when it comes to the next phrase, ta da Ta -dum, ta -da -da -da. Ta -dum, ta -da. Each time something appears, something I haven't mentioned is, is rhetoric, okay, and repetition and all of those things. There's not um, enough time. There's some wonderful books I can recommend that you, you know, have a look into. But you know what? The brilliant thing about what we do is that we never know it's all that we spend a lifetime finding things. And if this is something that I can help you kind of spark your imagination then i'm really pleased <laughs> um about that i think that's really really important uh, now i just wanted to talk briefly about the fugue now the fugue is full of self-accompanied melody do you know what that means marie no <laughs> okay, that's fine i think it's really clever when composers do counterpoint Okay, that managed to read to write two parts, two part writing. And I don't know if you realized, but your theme okay, repeats over and over and over underneath a ton of notes. Do you know where they are? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, so what you need to, and this is where the counterpoint is and the self accompanied melody, because when you've got this now that is repeated um immediately in upbeat to bar 23 but down the octave but what Telemann does because he's a good boy and clever it's there <laughs> and it repeated over and over and something like this where you have in bar 29 and 28 where you have a repetition over a pedal and your pedal is f so really what you've got Can you hear the two-part writing? Yeah. And that's what I mean about self-accompanied melody. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the fun of this piece is also to find um, where you can find. And it inverts it. For instance, bar 58, you've got the theme back to its original key. But actually, what it writes... <laughs> which is really clever and the whole piece is full of that and I think uh, when when you think back to what I said in the beginning about composers thinking that solo instruments um, you couldn't really write solo pieces for them and accompanied because they couldn't hold themselves harmonically well guess what they can <laughs> 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 
That's a really interesting point, Lisette, because um, it makes me think about Bach, the solo cellist. It's exactly the same thing. As a cellist, I have, you know, I've got the capability of, of low harmony there, but also we get the melody as well. And it's always identifying in whatever your instrument, the treble and the bass as yeah. a soloist, so that you can be your own accompanist, really. Absolutely. And, and also the so important fundamental about Baroque music, and again, jazz, is that bass is everything. <laughs> everything is built bass up. Make no mistake, everything is about harmony. <laughs> Find your harmony, learn your harmony, learn your harmony progressions when it comes to a piece of solo piece is more important than ever. Build your own bass line. I, I, I think, sadly, we've run out of time. I'd like to thank you enormously, Marie, for, for playing. I know how strange it feels to sit in your room, wherever, <laughs> and play to a computer. It's a phenomenal thing to have done. And I, all of us, I know, enjoyed your playing. And it was amazing to hear, just in this short space of time, in half an hour, the difference um, from, from your very opening bars to once you um, tried a few of Lisette's suggestions. So thank you very, very much. Um, <laughs> do, I, I would like to thank you too, and to Lisette, because uh, in quarantine, it's been a long time since I played <laughs> for someone. So I just kind of wanted to get it back to it. Oh, and it, it isn't possible, especially in Czech Republic, the COVID situation is really bad. It's mm -hmm. bad. So uh, I just wanted to kind of, um, know how it feels again to play in front yeah. of someone <laughs> even if I was really nervous I just wanted to have the kind of feeling again so thank you so much for having me and for the opportunity to play it's a pleasure and I I cannot tell you how much we all feel the same and I think I am so privileged that I got to hear you all the way in the Czech Republic and my heart and my soul and my musical soul are with you in this moment and I think we are connected through this medium, which is fantastic. So good for you, keep going. And if you have any questions, I'm here. Yeah, do do email attendees and panelists, do email. I'm, I'm sitting here, I can uh, certainly try and field any questions, anything I can't answer, I'm noting down for Lisette or I to answer and we'll, we can be in touch, I've got email addresses. Um, but for now, it remains, uh, for, for if Marie, if you don't mind putting yourself on mute, um, yeah. that would be fantastic. But do stay and watch, because I think what Lisette's saying is relevant for every musician and not just flautists or, or recorder players. I'm learning a lot here as well. It's yeah. fantastic. Um, but so now I think, Clara, if you'd like to unmute, um, hope I pronounced your name correctly, and maybe just give a little introduction um, to say who you are and where you study. I'm sorry we didn't um, hear that from you, Marie, but perhaps you could put in the chat um you know where you're from and where you're studying that would be really interesting thank you so over to you clara yeah hi uh it's it's correct it's uh, clara i am uh, from uh, latvia from uh, riga from the capital city and i'm studying my second year in a, a music secondary school which is basically like a high school it's just called a little bit different so uh, the modern flute and i'm uh, trying to get more into baroque music that's why i'm so thankful that i can I play for you today, Lizette. Oh. And uh, I'll be playing the fifth fantasy for you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Claire. I'm very familiar with the school system. Um, it's middle school, what you call, isn't it? And yeah. it's a specialized music school. Because I have, and I know there are quite a few um, Slovenian um, friends um, listening, and they have a similar system. So I know mm. very well. <laughs> and um, I miss Slovenia, I miss all of you. Um, and it's just a thrill to, because I do a lot of work with modern flute players okay, into the rock great. style. So this is not new, <laughs> which is what I've done over the years, many, much, much um, work. Now, um, Clara, I thought I would also start um, um, with talking about the key of your piece. And then, I don't know, have you seen a Baroque flute? Yes, of course, I have. Fantastic. I'm thrilled because not everyone of, of your age would. I, I, I have a feeling because I know that for you to be in middle school and for you to be doing what you're doing, that you're really good. OK, and you're very advanced. And but I, I, I absolutely get that. <laughs> I know. So I'm really looking forward to hearing you. All right. So with the C major one, which is fantasy of five, Matheson, which is, um, again, a very important um, German theoretist theoreticist, I've got two quotes from him about the key of C major 
with different dates, which I thought would be really interesting because, um, of course, these are not def definitives, all this um, theoreticists who have a very specific ideas about keys and about what they mean and the meaning of things. They were as diverse and opposing as you can get. Okay, this is by no means the final one, but the but Matheson in particular, because he was German and known to Telemann very much, I thought that would be interesting. Um, and I also um, give you um, Rameau because he was also known to them. Um, and this is the closest I could find to the publication of um, the Telemann Fantasias because there's many others after. Okay. Um, as well than that. So there we go. Matheson in 1714 says, are you ready? Has a rather rude and impudent character. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How about that? I think it's marvellous. But it is also suited to rejoicing and other occasions where joy is in full hope. Okay. Oh my goodness, I think, I love that. I love the thought of that joy is in full hope. Because yeah. goodness me, we need it. <laughs> we really need it at the moment. Okay. In 1719, he said, most common of all, but even this trivial key can, can be made to sound somewhat tender and touching. Mm. And Rameau in 1722 says that it's about songs of mirth and rejoicing. Now, I must say, um, for those who know me very well know that I'm quite fond of Rameau, mildly, putting it mildly, um, just a little bit. But I also that, you know, his treatise on harmony was really fundamental. Actually, on the fundamental base. <laughs> was very fundamental in the 18th century and I mention him because he was an opera composer that wrote in a very specific way with the most wonderful command of colours and intention and symbolism mm -hmm. attached to it. So mm -hmm. I always take what he says um, a serious, not seriously in the sense that it's the ultimate thing, answer to anything, but yeah. you know I think he had something. Actually it's on my wall I don't know if you can see. Okay. <laughs> I've got Bach Partita, the A minor Bach Partita, yeah. and I've got Ramo. So I think we're in good company. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> I don't have Telemann, but we're in good company now. Of your C minor, <laughs> I am a major geek. It is true. Um, and proud. Aren't, uh, aren't we all? <laughs> oh, thank <laughs> God. Thank God. This is what we're all here for. Yeah, bring on the geekery. I'm all for it. I'm here for it. <laughs> Okay, so that your C major fantasy, there's a structure to it, okay? So we've got, um, and I wanted to say it um, because of what I said in the beginning about the uh, what this fantasy means, because the first overture is a capriccio, really. And by that, really, I mean, if you look at the way it's constructed, it is like an improvisation, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah very much so so it's a play on it so that leaves everything open to interpretation mm -hmm. do you play yeah. it very fast do you start slow do you know what i mean yeah yeah i get you really and then you've got um the three two which is really a chacon or passacala mm -hmm. okay in mm -hmm. three uh with a very clear four bar structure isn't it and we yeah. will talk about harmonic rhythm there especially as well um, and then you've got um, the dance, the, um, the giga afterwards, mm -hmm. um, which has got an enormous amount of self-accompanying melody. And boy, are we going to have fun with that <laughs> if I've got time. <laughs> and then the last movement, again, talking about influences, really is a giga, but it's in the shape and a form of a canary. Canary, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. And a canary is a French dance. It's light and bright, and um, I suppose can I can I call it a bit peasanty? It's got this sort of pastoral thing. Yeah, yeah. I can almost hear a drone underneath. Yeah. I can hear birds chirping. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> bunnies hopping you know it's just really joyful yeah i i uh, actually did a small research on the kennedy so yeah. i actually saw some like uh, videos and it's really just like joyful natural dance sort of yeah yes, yes. and for all of you who are listening wherever you come in the world do have a look at baroque dance and all the steps all the forms of it because so much of baroque dance is informed by by mm. dance and well done you for doing that that's fantastic that you knew what the canary is i'm beyond impressed <laughs> i'm beyond impressed so well done that's fantastic right without further ado take it away and then we'll talk about all kinds of things but go for it Thank you. 
wow that was all kinds of fabulous what a fantastic player you are my goodness the amount of talent and musicality <laughs> that was amazing i could hear so much good stuff and what a thoughtful player you are as well fantastic you've got the world at your feet madam it's brilliant <laughs> really you. lovely um now it's really i just thought it was just beautiful there's so much there that already you've put so much thought into it's really really lovely now what i'm going to do um first just the technical really boring thing now there's a note um 23 about 34 mm -hmm. the f sharp on the third dotted crotchet it's an f sharp not an f natural oh, by okay. the way then that was a mistake. I, I, I know it's an F sharp. <laughs> okay, because I've got <laughs> no, because I'm the reason what I'm saying is I didn't know is some um, uh, editions don't have it as an F sharp. Oh, really? Okay. That's why. I, That's I, why I'm saying. <laughs> because <laughs> also the other thing I forgot to say to Marie is go to the original sources. Always go to the original text. And I happen mm -hmm. to have um, a printout. This is yours. <laughs> and I think actually these are Telemann's own um, engraving. He did it by himself. Mm -hmm. um, and okay. they're beautiful. So there's 12 fantasias, there's 12 plates, and they were printed okay. like this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, this you can find on, on IMSLP. Okay. And it's yeah. free. Um, I think some of them, as you can see, if you have a close look and it's free, it's on uh, public domain, which is very important. Mm -hmm. um you can see i mean these were beautifully printed but they can be rather tricky to read because they're so close because they had to fit everything. Okay. yeah but no doubt i mean as i'm sure you have a good edition i think there's so many good editions the best editions are the ones who have nothing added to them mm, yeah mm -hmm. always because um i don't know if you know this but in, in the 18th century it was very rare that they published anything with lots of performance directions that's mm -hmm. a very 19th century thing i yeah. think fundamentally they thought you knew or one knew what to do with the music okay, okay. Yeah. but they never guessed that 350 years later we're going um <laughs> <laughs> exactly what are we doing there's no youtube videos <laughs> There's nothing um, for us. So what we do is that we look at the original text, we look at the original instrument, so we have an idea of the sound, um, and we also have an idea of, you know, where certain things lie. Now, the next thing I'd like to talk about is the key. Now, C major, sort of on any um, sort of modern instrument. I mean, you know that the piano has all the semitones distributed equally, for instance, mm -hmm. so every note sounds the same. And I know the flutes I play, um, what I call modern flute, <laughs> or you probably con call it concert flute, but because yeah. um, in some countries, they, you know, the, the name does um, rather change. But with a Baroque flute, C major is actually a really tricky key, as is A minor, mm -hmm. by the way. Okay. Um, and the reason for that being, or for instance, on your opening um, statement, I have to. Just on those notes. whatever it is you want to do with it i need to tell you that the f natural is a really tricky key mm -hmm. a really tricky note yeah for instance because it's not notes that on the modern flute so you've got c d e and then you've got an f with a little key mm -hmm. isn't it and it's nice and straightforward on here it really isn't it's a mm -hmm. note if i play it without adjusting can you hear yeah with adjusting mm. so naturally is a sharp key and i'll tell you why on this instrument because i don't have the same amount of keys you've got six holes and a key for the e flat 
Kwanzaa's flute has two keys. One mm. for E flat, one for D sharp, by the way, mm. <laughs> which is already something that is changing. There's nothing at the back. Oh, okay. So we play exactly the same, but um, with, with a very different system in mind. So that you've got main notes. So if the tube is completely open, you've got bright open notes, okay? I love the sound of the way of the baroque flute because it's honeyed it's got this roundness mm -hmm. and gentleness yeah and your flute is beautiful too it's just that we need to find a way of thinking yeah. of the sound in a different way does that make sense yeah of course yeah mm -hmm. and so when i've got a note that such as for instance i then f when i'm going to do an a flat or g sharp Can you hear the difference in color? Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that being, whereas on the modern flute, you press the G sharp key, <laughs> which is one of the reasons it's there for to help, you know, is that you are cutting the sound into half so that you get what is in effect a harmonic note. Mm -hmm. But what it does happen really is that you get color so mm -hmm. the rock flute is an uneven instrument but boy does it have color <laughs> boy okay. does it have so we always make something that at face value could be thought of uh, less um, a problem into something really special so keys have an even more important meaning if i play anything in d major because this flute is in d everything would automatically sound bright much brighter yeah. but if i go into flat keys it will have um a much gentler darker quality okay. okay and of course you're not your instrument is different but it's just bearing in mind um and i thought for instance you did really well with the opening i thought you can experiment and maybe even each day will be different mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? It's wherever your inspiration is. So one day you can be um, softer or the other day louder, faster. There's no right or wrong in this. Okay. What I liked about what you did already is that you had a really clear idea of where the phrase was. Mm -hmm. okay. And that is really nice. Thank you. Because... <laughs> um... you can have so many mm -hmm. but with a pedal note yes mm -hmm. it's with a blanket flute uh -huh. <laughs> do you see what i mean you can do mm -hmm. so many things with it and i would I'm, I am not against vibrato, and already you have um, such a lovely tone. Mm -hmm. But I think there's, you can think, again, what I was saying to Marie, it's about thinking outside of it being a flute. Yeah, okay, yeah. What colours, what instruments can you convey? Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. What yeah. vowels do you think of when you play? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, because that really transforms and changes the sound. The same is for the recorder. Exactly the same, Clara. And mm -hmm. I know you are going to really have a good think about it. It's just fantastic. Do you want to just have a little go at that? Because we not, don't have a lot of time. I could talk about this for hours. Okay. okay. Just the opening so, section. Just yeah. see, just see. Dynamically with, you know, mm -hmm. just see. Okay. There's no wrong. There's no wrong in this, by the way. Okay. You okay? Lovely. That's really good. Now, what I have a sense of when you play 
is that there is it's like something opening up in all its fabulousness how you get there then it doesn't you know matter so much but enjoy it it's a good old c major scale there's nothing wrong with it and i love that it has such a joyous opening it invites me in when I'm listening. I think, oh, I'd like to hear that, thank you. <laughs> and then you've got the duds, which you did beautifully. And by the way, those slurs are original. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'd like to point out that they are um, not in the most normal of places. In the 18th century, you would normally not have a slur across um to a strong beat oh okay do you see what i mean you more readily would have a slur say for instance if you do a four notes that you would slur it in twos but mm -hmm. what you normally wouldn't do would be so i think it's significant yeah because it's unusual but not uncommon in telemann okay okay yeah. that's really cool now also i'll tell you that normally and the cp bar talks about it i mean it's really good if you go and read quants on playing the flute for instance for flute okay. playing. Yeah. it's mm -hmm. wonderful it's got some really fun facts i like things in fun facts <laughs> It reads like a novel and it's got some interesting and beautiful advice for young okay. players and people who want to become musicians about being in it with your heart, about the right things, about it's not about how much money you've got, how much status, it's about your yeah. ability and your own, you know, heart. What I think oh, is yeah. wonderful. Um, I'll first, first take a look at it. Yeah, yeah, do, do. Um, and so, yes, so that, for instance, see if you have sons, bar son says that a slur um denotes a decrescendo mm -hmm. okay so when you slur especially with twos that you'd have a decrescendo so rather than going uh, towards the third note so this is bar five changes the character a little mm -hmm. bit so you may want to play with it i think the speed you did was fine i think i would be careful not to be too slow yeah okay, yeah. okay. Sure. however yeah. saying that i was very impressed with the amount of shape you did because playing slowly is hard yeah. <laughs> it's far harder than playing fast yeah for sure yeah do you know what I mean? So um, I think you did really, really well with it. Now, then you've got the same thing repeated in G major. Now, which one do you think has the biggest impact? The first opening uh, sequence or the one that starts um, upbeat to bar nine? Uh, I would say the first. Absolutely, 100%. And also because it's higher mm -hmm. and louder. Also because you've heard it for the first time. Yeah. For the second time, it's about colour, it's about something else, isn't it? Yeah. And also it precedes a longer section of the Chacon or Pasacala. Mm -hmm. And then there you have to really pay attention to um harmonic rhythm because what you do have on the first opening section, the second, da -ti -da -ti -da -da, is really a pedal, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And he yeah. does, by the way, Telemann does it in other pieces i don't know for those of you who um play the recorder there's a very famous c major sonata because it does it does do that mm -hmm. um sometimes and that kind of reminds me of that idea it's very telemant to do now mm -hmm. When it comes to harmonic rhythm, and now the, the next section, the, the second largo moves in four bars, right? So you've got. 
And I'm just playing you the main melody, by the way, yeah. without the ornaments. It's the very end of it, I think is really interesting. So you've got ti da ti da da, which is in somewhat a reminiscing of the opening because it's a pedal still, but with these gorgeous little ornaments that you did mm -hmm. so beautifully. But it finishes on a dominant chord, I can hear. Yeah. <laughs> Right, okay, so we, oh, I know we've run out of time, but basically that section finishes on another fifth chord that goes into the Allegro. Right, Clara, I hope I've given you something to think about. Yes, you of are, course. You are a beautiful player, you really are. And I really, I was very, very impressed with what you can already do at your age mm -hmm. and how much thought and that you put into it. So well done. If you have any questions, again, mm -hmm. do ask, okay? Yeah. It, um, questions with treat us with anything at all. I hope I can help. <laughs> and okay, thank I'm you sorry. for being so brave. <laughs> thank you okay. very much, Clara. And and that goes for all attendee panelists, attendees. Um, I'm wondering if not all the questions are visible. I, I I've had a comment that the answers are visible, but not always the questions. So do if you, if you'd like something answered, do put the do ask again, and I'll try and answer it and email us um but that remains for me to thank you very much clara again for being very brave and just standing up in your room at home and performing um takes quite some guts to do that as it did for you too marie thank you to both of you i've hugely enjoyed both of your performances so far and um i'm very much looking forward now so we should hand over to kira who i believe is in england hi kira <laughs> and again thank you it's just so lovely to see you and i know it is um to, for a rather important um occasion your master's recital which is an amazing thing and again thank you for being so incredibly brave and and brilliant for coming through <laughs> but i can't wait this is so cool okay now let me just give you a little bit of info about the key of your piece um just in case you don't know so this piece, the D minor, this is Fantasia number three in D minor. And um, the, the original key is B minor. And Mathis, and again, I've got three quotes, one from 1713, another one 1719, and Ramor in 1722. So Matheson says in 1713 that B minor, pieces in B minor are bizarre, morose, and melancholy because of this it is seldom used okay fast forward a few years okay you've got so it's seldom used so Matheson in 1719 <laughs> says not at all rare <laughs> what happened <laughs> <In a few. laughs> examples appear every day how about that um, when performed under certain circumstances, it can touch the heart. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> but it's not being bizarre and rarely used because it's bizarre. Although bizarre is a perfectly good, I think it's a fabulous um, ad adjective, um, you know, for, for a key. And Ramon 1722 says it's sweet and tender. Okay, so the the structure of this particular fantasia is a capriccio. Okay, and again, let's think back to the very beginning of the etymology of the word of the meaning of fantasia, which also meant capriccio. Okay, so um, and then a gig at the end because these tend to have um, 
the sort of whatever they are in structure if it's um a capriccio if it's um i don't know a toccata actually the first one is a toccata and fugue you, you have so many but they tend to always uh, finish with a with a dance which is really really good i must also say that part of this idea of fantasy and caprice is the idea of improvisation and i think i i need to stress this because i think it's probably used a lot more by organists, for instance, you know, um, and, you know, Bach wrote uh, many of that and, and wrote them, his own improvisations down eventually. Um, but I think there is scope for that. And I think for us as interpreters, that must open a world, which is fantastic. Right, Kira, without further ado, I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> Thank you.
bravo, Kira. Wow, so much good stuff in there, Bloma. I could absolutely hear so uh, clearly what you're doing. Really good. So hopefully what I can do for you today is to help you expand on that. And of course, I know what it is like to play first thing and there's nerves and, <laughs> and I think you did such a good job. Can I, can I, can yeah. I just say, sorry, Kira, have you got the original sound turned on on the computer? I don't know. Sorry. Ah, because occasion, just occasionally it cut out, and that could be to do with the, your settings. Uh, we heard, I heard nearly, nearly all of it. It was wonderful. But just to make sure that everyone can hear you properly, you need to go, um, uh, you know, the little at the bottom of the screen where it says mute or stop video? Um, yeah. Click on the little arrow next to that. And it should bring you up with some options, audio settings. No, I haven't got that, sorry. Okay. Um, well, I think maybe if you, it was just some of the um, higher registers, I think, maybe the microphone, it cut it out. So perhaps... Oh, I found it. I, I found, yeah. Great. <laughs> okay. Session. Uh, audio settings, uh, and then go on to advanced. Yeah. At the bottom, and then click... Um, uh, da, 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 da. You need to disable uh, the persistent background noise and disable the inter and suppress all those top things and and then um, cl click. It should be clicked. Show in meeting option to enable original sound. And that should help, I think. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, sorry. Back, no, back, sorry. Back to playing. <laughs> um, those who know me will know that I'm not very good at tech. So hopefully, I've got that right. <laughs> I think you're doing a brilliant job, Tati. This could not happen without you. <laughs> right, back, back to the music making. Oh, okay, thank you so much. Brilliant. Okay, Kira, I thought, like I say, you know, it's very accomplished. You did a really, really good job. And I could absolutely hear with very clear intention of what you're doing. Um, if I can help you today to amplify what's there and to give you sort of the sort of um, inspiration and to, to take more risks. <laughs> what you're doing is great and what you're doing is really good um and so the first thing what one one of the first things that goes with with nerves is is breathing <laughs> and that opening is really tricky and i <laughs> i know it is trust me <laughs> i've been there many many times so the thing to remember is what to do with the ends of notes and for us recorder players, there are a few things which I'm sure you know. Um, Speed-wise, I thought it was fun. Again, there is no right and wrong with this. Do you see what I mean? If the intention is correct um, and the effect of the affect, do you understand what that means? Yeah. Because the, those are different. And this is a yeah. really <laughs> important 18th century um, so when I talk about affect, I talk about mood, I talk about character, I talk about, this is kind of leaning now towards the rhetoric because yeah. it's a tool, isn't it? It's a rhetorical tool. And for those who don't know, um, rhetoric is the art of convincing the listener to your uh, argument, okay? And um, in the current climate, if one, talks and, and thinks about um, politicians or anyone giving a speech, you know, you will get um, some who are better than others, but, but it's the sort of thing that holds the listener's attention and convince them to, to what um, they are saying. In the 18th century, this was normal and studied and understood and known by everyone. That art was somewhat um, lost in the 19th century. Other things were added, but certain things were, were really lost. So it's up to us to recapture. And again, it's to create that magic around you, that the air around you holds you and your sound and your story. Do you see what I mean? It belongs to you, it's yours, and uh, you are entitled to it. So, you know, this is, if I can help you, with getting that create space to expand the in the space around you, that would be because I can hear what you're doing so beautifully. It's fantastic. Now, when it comes to ends of the notes, um, very 
quick thing that you can do. So what do we want with an end of note normally? Um, for, well, not to sag. Mm. That's it. That it ultimately is really for it not to sag, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, on the flute, of course, our job in a way is made much easier because we can lip up. <laughs> on the recorder, we don't have that because we don't, our, our making of sound is different. Um, and so from, if you don't do anything to the sound, then there's a sag at the end, which we know about. Now, there are a few tricks we can do. One immediately is to change the speed at which the air moves. Um, and you can use your tongue, the back of your tongue, to create less or more space for the air. So that the tongue is down, you have more air. But if you've got the tongue up, you can create a slight sharpening of the sound. And another thing you can do to add to that is um, to just shift your fingers so that you leak some air. And by doing that, you're going to sharpen the sound. Now, if you manage, manage to time the two together, you can really taper off. And it's a fine art. And I must say for all of you playing and listening, to me personally, virtuosism does not lie on how many notes you can play to the minute. Virtuosism is what you do with the harmony and with the sound. How well can you control your instrument? What can you do with musical ideas? That to me, and I think that was a very much an 18th century idea too. And there's a beauty and depth to it. And I think little things like that is where you really can tell where you're at, which is fantastic. Right, Kira, just have a little go, because you did beautifully. So basically the first phrase, as you well know, right? That's what it is. So you've got to go from the tonic to the dominant, which creates expectation and then you've got that wonderful two rests <laughs> that you can really play with do you see what i mean but boy that low a is is scary to come off <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now another thing i think is really lovely is what he does with the dissonance because where does he put the dissonance he puts the rest over to the strong beat so it's creating a, quite an effect. Do you see what yeah, I mean? Yeah, I think. Because he didn't have to do that. He, if, he, if he did, you would have not, not any, you would have been not, none the wiser yeah. to what the possibility of. ornament yeah. and white telling because of the placing of that slur as well and again I refer to jazz it's a bit of the blue note isn't it <laughs> <laughs> and I think what can you do with the color what a fabulous thing to play with the first bit I was so impressed with how clear it was that is not a problem what we can do with that is have a bit more fun <laughs> moments you know finally you've got a resolution <laughs> but you know that <laughs> but i think it's so nice to go back to all the fundamentals and see where that the harmony drives the storytelling 
forget about bar lines. Bar lines mean nothing, but you know that, and I know that you do know that. And it's really to see where where you go with it. Okay, start again. That beginning is really difficult. <laughs> Make no mistake, anything that starts with something slow and sustained. Oof. Go for it. Go, Kira. Enjoy. <laughs> Yes, thank you. And what I'd like to hear is an even bigger pull towards the dominant. Because as you know, the dominant has an enormous pull. I, I've heard some colleagues say that, you know, there should be a whole thesis written on the role of the dominant, how important it is. Because it's a, it's a law of attraction, isn't it? <laughs> that dominant chord. Yeah. It's this. And then you get rest. <gasps> what a great composer. <laughs> So, how much can you create expectation? Because the other thing is, once you've got that second bow with the dissonance, anything can happen. Do you see what I mean? fun it's all there for you right do it again do it again and just see slow it down i mean try try different things try different things and um there's nothing wrong with ornamenting i personally tend to not ornament too much because i tend to think more about what's there and if i add something it's because there's a very good reason i wouldn't worry too much of having to do all these clever things because sometimes they're not clever at all <laughs> the one you did do was fine by the way it was fine and lovely. No, 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 no. I didn't mean you. <laughs> but in generally, um, yeah, sometimes too many ornaments mask things. And I really want to hear the purity and the drive of the main line. And only when you've got that, then you can do ornaments. And that sound and what you do with it can in itself be an ornament. Do you see what I mean? And I believe in that a little bit more. So go for it. <laughs> you took in between those also let's think about the articulation you're doing it really clearly but perhaps you can think of lengthening some of them depending where they are in the storytelling do you see what i mean yeah so within that So you can lengthen or shorten depending on where the phrase is and that should help with the elasticity of the narrative do you see what i mean because music is never static and the idea of um you know playing metronome which you don't so don't worry but that you shouldn't really it's not about the pulse is not about being metronomic it's about being right for the phrase and right for the harmony within reason in baroque music we i like saying and a lot of people say that you are free within four walls yeah. okay and within that i will say it again you can play on the back of the beat the you know front of the beat and the edge of the beat the side of the beat <laughs> which i quite like the idea of it's just finding ways of playing with it without ever losing the thread how far can you go without losing that thread what can you do that's i think is where the real virtuosity i think is very very cool 
just give it a go and just I you can slow it down you can play at the same speed it's all fine because I know you've got the ability to do it but just think of what you can do with the length of articulation do you how do you start the note some will need more front some less so do you see what I mean because yeah. articulation is such a broad thing again you can play on the edge on the back on the side <laughs> Also, you have at your disposal the most perfect resonance box in the world, which is your own body, isn't it? And your own cavities. All of these, for those um, who are not players that are listening, um, singers use um, the resonance points in their heads and in their bodies to make um, notes resonate and to find Round, the resonance, what I mean is the roundness, the point at which the note is its fullest and rounder and shinier. Okay, so for us, for instance, um, it is a, a, a job of wonder, work of wonder and, and joy to, to find where those things are. <laughs> um, where you have nasal notes, you have middle notes, you have head notes, you've got notes here also this is why posture is so important that you use the whole of your body to um, resonate from the lowest part because you'll use your body from the tip of your toes to the top of your hair it's all important it goes into sound making so using your breath capacity well having everything open and yet aware is a really good thing and from there that's your center you always play from your center and good technique should feel easier <laughs> not harder <laughs> and um, another thing this is not just for you Kira but um but never play on pain pain is a very important message from your body telling you something isn't right okay if you can practice at home with a mirror as well so you check but having a sense of where you stand and where your center is, is very, very important. Right. So on that note, um, you can, if, why don't you go from the Vivace and okay. just see, just see, because I know you know it really well and it sounds great. different lengths and different things yeah. and now let yourself be immersed in how it feels when the harmony shifts do you see what I mean because it's actually physical sensation as much as it's an emotional sensation because both of them are um are connected and again I'm brought to Descartes and the passions of the soul and the moving the passions of the soul is something I haven't yet touched upon but the changing in the moving harmonies was supposed to um, move you as a listener, which is why um, there was so much attached to each key, because they were supposed to represent certain things. There were also depictions of physical expressions for those um, um, emotions as well. There's been some wonderful work. Um, there's a colleague in Holland, um, called Jed Wins, who's an absolute genius at this. He's a fantastic flute player and a fantastic scholar. And he's, I've, I've attended um, as a student some brilliant lectures um, talking about just that. And it's really fun, really, really fun to watch. But it's all connected. Um, it really, really is. So when it comes to the end of that very phrase, we're nearly at the end. So. Um, <laughs>
So whatever way you can bring out, because you know what I played, obviously, I just played the main melody and I can hear that you know where it is. But I wonder if you can play more of that, be more extreme, experiment. Because, you know, at the end of the day, your performance is about how you feel about the piece. But without fear. Yeah. <laughs> and one thing about getting older, personally, you're very young and you're all brilliantly young. And it's a wonderful thing to be young and to be of all ages is that um, you play less and less for others and more and more for you. Because the beauty of all this is that there is not one performance like another. I mean, do listen to great players for inspiration, but then find your own because you are unique. And that is so important. And be unique and you're in the fullness of yourself and find your way again with informed choices because we are playing on historical instruments, historical music. <laughs> But within that, within those four walls, there's a huge amount of space for you and your fabulous personality. Really is. I'm so pleased to hear you, Kira. Thank you so much for playing. <laughs> really good. Tati, do you want right, to? Sorry, I forgot to unmute. No, no, that's I, fine. I just want to thank all three of you. I'm glad you've all come back onto the picture. And Marie, stay here. I, don't, don't turn your video off because we'd like to thank you all I mean first of all I'd like to thank Lisette um okay. I, I never cease to be amazed by your inspirational teaching it's <laughs> such a pleasure to listen to actually and as you say relevant for all instruments not just um uh recorder not just within flute in instruments absolutely relevant and thank you so much but it remains for me to, to and this is possible this this masterclass through funding from the arts council of england so thank you to the arts council but also thank you to marie for your beautiful playing to clara for your beautiful playing and to kira for your beautiful playing i've enjoyed each of your performances i've been sat here in my office in london just having a marvellous time, really, fielding a few questions from from people and, and really just hearing your different styles and hearing how you've interpreted what Lisette has offered you. I mean, to fit a masterclass into a short space of time is, is tough. So, I mean, as she's given you lots of food for thought for ongoing work, I'm sure. Um, so really, thank you very much for joining us. And I know our our attendees, there are lots of them and they've all enjoyed um, your performances. Many of them have put that in the chat. Anyone watching this, do feel free to ask any questions. You might have to go. I know we, we've overrun a little bit, but I know there's one question from Daniela um, to Lisette yes. about um, the, the, the D minor fantasy, the sixth one. But, um, but do, do feel um, free to type some questions. Yes, and absolutely. The, the number six. Yeah, and, and just whilst Lizette's getting ready to answer that, do tune in for the next one on the 21st of November, three o'clock, handle flutes and artists and recorder sonatas. If you'd like to participate in the way that we've been so fortunate today to hear Marie, Clara and Kira, do email trust at brookstreetband.co.uk or if you get the email address, look up the Brook Street Band on our website. Um, and there are lots of videos available on our YouTube channel as well. So do hop over there and see what's there. But back to Lisette very briefly for the questions. And it's been such a fun afternoon. Thank you. Over to you, Lisette. Right. Um, I'm open to questions. So um, there's a question about, oh, before I forget, there was a question, a very interesting question that came from Anna Vrind yesterday about the etymological background of the word fantasy, which I hope I answered a little bit in the beginning. And also if there was anything connecting to this Moroccan, um, was it a particular play? Um, and um, I uh, promptly asked my, my husband, who's um, a linguist, and he said he couldn't find any tracing of it, but he believes it was probably inherited through trade. And that it might have amalgamated because very often that's how languages um, travel and you can have words in different languages um, that are brought in um, from that. So thank you for the question. <laughs>
Right, I'd like to, um, what was the question about fantasy of sex? Yes, about the key. Um, I'll just call up the question again. Um, it was specifically, oh, where's it gone? Yeah. Um, Lisette, what do you think about the D minor in fantasy six? That was the question from Daniela. I don't know if okay. Daniela, you want Daniela, to Daniela, do you mean the, char the key characteristics of D minor? You can just type your answer in the chat or the question and I'll do yeah. that. Because I've got now, for those who are interested um, <laughs> in these things, this book is um, fantastic. And I don't know that you can sing. Yes. Okay. Daniela, this book is brilliant. And I've relied on a lot of hours of fun um, when it comes to it. So I'm going to look up D minor. Yeah, Daniela's just typed that she has the character. The question refers to the character. That's fine. Let me have a look. Right, D minor. So let's have a look at the round the time. Matheson. Yes, I can. Um, it's called History of Key Characteristics in the... <laughs> Hang on, <laughs> I'll, I'll type it. History, history of Key Characteristics. In the 18th and early 19th centuries. Okay. Great. By Rita Steblin. Okay. And it's a brilliant study of, of keys um, and all kind of wonderful backgrounds. It's really, really lovely. Now then, so let me um, give you D minor. I mean, there's a few from Rousseau, Charpentier, Charles Mason, uh, Masson or Matheson, I'm going to say, because I've been referring to him because he's getting closer to um, Telemann's time. So the first I've got from him is, um, I'm going to give you two, one from 1713, which is somewhat devout, calm, also somewhat grand, pleasant, and expressive of contentment. Therefore, it is capable of promoting devotion in church matters. Well, there you go. Who knew? And peace of mind in common life. Who doesn't want peace of mind in common life? <laughs> there's more. Oh, there's more. Clearly, Matheson thought very much of this one. However, this does not prevent a successful use of this key for something amusing, not particularly skipping. Let's not get too excited, but rather flowing in nature. Rameau just says it is sweet and tender. But for the fantasy uh, six, which is a rather beautiful, powerful piece, um, I, I really love, I mean, I love all of them really. Um, and, uh, but it's got the most wonderful first movement and um, setting of it, doesn't it? And it's, it's there's a very um, wonderfully introspect and, and serious um, quality to it. Um, and then a wonderful fugue Fugal's second movement, and then the spiritualist, which is a lovely dance at the end. Um, but it all has this melancholy about it, which is really uh, particular. I love it. I absolutely love it. I'm, Lisette, I'm just saying, I've just put in the chat how I found that so interesting, how the characteristics are interpreted differently by different composers. I mean, peace of mind in common life. That's D minor, yeah? Yes. Now, the second cello suite by Bach. D minor, I would not have uh, put, I, to me that has a very different feeling. I suppose it's really interesting to consider different it, composers' interpretations. It is really interesting because Bach would have known of Matheson. Yeah. They were, you know, pretty much contemporaries. Yeah. And I think there is something about fashion. Okay, this is something I've learned again with um, being a researcher, um, is that, all of these things are very interesting, but they also come on the back of fashion, what's fashionable and acceptable. And I think what we've seen from Matheson in the space of four years, five years, is how things change. So I, uh, this is why I also took care to find the closest to Telemann's dates, because that also, you know, will change greatly. Yeah. <laughs> But it's a really interesting subject, also linked with temperament, by the way. Mm. Key and temperament are absolutely deeply connected. One really cannot exist without the other, because in modern um, music making, where everything, all the semitones are the same, pretty much one could almost say that all keys sound the same. 
Now, in the 18th century, if you've got temperament, and that means that the distribution of the commas, which is the space between the notes, okay, is put in particular places to favor some keys and less others or to make certain keys brighter and others not. So if you've got something in F sharp major as opposed to G major, you're going to really hear the difference and very dissonant different. Yeah. Lisette, I've got a question um, from Jessica here. I'll read out what she's written actually. It's again about the same piece. Yeah. I have often wondered about number six. It's a bear for recorder. The key of D minor is a pretty friendly key for traverso, although this particular piece does have some chromaticism that's a bit challenging. Mm -hmm. But the recorder transposition is F minor, which is a pretty difficult key. Yes. Wouldn't we be happier playing it for recorderists in G minor or playing it in D minor on tenor? Do you know what? That is such a good question. And it is one that doesn't have a clear cut answer and i hear you because being a flute player and a recorder player i really have a foot in both camps and actually when i recorded this for, for the um, this project it's on our tube channel i actually chose the fantasy of six um on purpose and i played it on the recorder now i think the reason why i like it in f minor although it's a complete bear to play I would say another B word, but uh, <laughs> I'll be polite. But um, it's because of color. It's because of color and because of the color possibilities. And that's what I love. Now on the flute, D minor is quite um, a dark color because of the F naturals in B flats. Okay. Um, and D minor is fabulous. We love D minor on the recorder. F major and D minor, bring it on. <laughs> B flat major, we are good for it too. <laughs> But anything um, that isn't, that is in um, F minor, has a really um, different feel to it. And I rather like the thought, not all the time, but sometimes there is space for adding something to the key. Because if I played it in D minor on the tenor recorder, it would feel different than it does on F minor. Of course, F minor has different associations in the 18th century, it's a very dark key. It can be um, a key associated with death, for instance, and, and darker things, but not always, not always. And I rather like what one can do with it. Now, if for, for recorder plays, you know the trist or trist at F minor, the um, sonata that has trist as the first movement. So Telemann did write for it in F minor. He didn't choose to write the fantasy, but absolutely, of course, you can transpose it. You can play it anywhere, as long as you enjoy it and you do lovely things. I think it's fantastic that different instruments with different keys, you bring different things to it. There's nothing wrong with that. I think that that leads me, I, we, we're massively overrunning, but it's just so interesting to hear all of this. But I mean, it just proves my, my well, any of us um, who, who love listening to music or performing it, which is all of us, I suspect, um, good music, you, you know, at transpositions, it, good music, you can, it can take any of these treatments, actually. You know, there, I've heard wonderful performances of pieces today in different keys. Um, I was noting the colour from the modern flute in C major and then the same um, piece played on your palanca, baroque flute, yeah, a semitone yeah, yeah. lower, how different that sounded, but each had um, magical qualities to them. Uh, and how, you know, good music can withstand, you know, transposition, playing. I heard a Bach cello suite uh, when I was at college um, played on the saxophone. It was absolutely wonderful. You know, a good musician and a good piece of music can take that. And that's what's so heartening, because all we are really is giving, all we're doing is giving voice to, to these to these composers' voices from 300 years ago in our own way and our own interpretation and bringing it back to life, which personally I love. So it just remains for me to thank you all one more time, Lisette, uh, Marie, Clara and Kira, and, and to all our attendees for, for listening. And do, if you have questions, do stay in touch by email. We're very happy. We're very good at answering emails, Lisette especially. <laughs> Lisette <laughs> I, talk, I, I talk a lot. No, Liz, that's the quickest person I know at responding to email. Sorry, I've put you on the spot there, but you're brilliant at it. So, um, but email me and I'll forward them on to her so she has some time to think about the answers. Um, lots of thanks coming in in the chat to you. Um, 
our YouTube channel. It's just, just look up Brook Street Band on the YouTube. Logo. Yeah, it's got the blue um, blue plaque logo. There is another Brook Street Band channel, which is called Brook Street Band Topic. And that that's not really ours. That's just uh, pre-recorded tracks. So find the blue plaque, the Brook Street Band in a blue circle, and you'll find us. And do subscribe, because that all helps at the moment when we can't actually make live music. And I'm so delighted that, Marie, you enjoyed having the chance to play live again following lockdown. I'm sure the same was true for you, Clara and Kira. I know it was so <laughs> Lizette and, and me when we played together a, a month ago we've just had a November can concert cancelled because of the pandemic it will happen again we'll all get to play live music again together soon and up till until then it's just great we can meet this way and and share your enthusiasm and, and, and passion for the music so thank you and um, be in touch be in touch soon and do come back for the 21st absolutely it'll be really fun thank you <laughs> Bye -bye. Yeah, thank you so much <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you.